Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, glad to have you. I'm Paul Glastris. I'm a senior fellow here at the New America Foundation and the editor of the Washington Monthly Magazine, and am uh, delighted to introduce this uh, panel of two great writers and friends and lively uh, thinkers uh, for a, a conversation about the experience of the Cold War and how it has made itself felt uh, since the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, 20 years ago. And uh, today we have uh, 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 ongoing ripples of, of, of that um, uh, experience and memory in different ways. Uh, at New America, we have two of the finer thinkers on uh, national security and history, uh, history thereof. Um, uh, Peter Beinart is a, uh, also a Schwartz Fellow here at New American, an Associate Professor of Journalism at uh, City University of New York, a graduate of Yale and Oxford. He edited The New Republic uh, from 1995 to 2006, was my editor on a couple of pieces, moving on to serve for two years as a Senior Fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations. He's written extensively for major publications throughout his career, and his latest book is uh, the Icarus Syndrome, which will be published next year. Nick Thompson, also a Schwartz Fellow and a senior editor at Wired Magazine, um, one-time editor of both Legal Affairs and the Washington Monthly, um, where we um, survived lovely uh, near-death experiences from time to time, uh, and uh, has gone on to uh, bigger and better things. He covers um, politics, law, and technology uh, issues now for uh, Wired. He uh, this September published The Hawk and the Dove, which explores the relationship between influential Cold Warriors Paul Nitza and George Kennan. So um, we're going to talk about a variety of things uh, today um, from uh, the president's speech last night and the, 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 uh, the extent to which Cold War thinking led to the development of the policy to um, whether containment can work as a uh, strategy for Iran, uh, a strategy for Al Qaeda, um, the great question uh, that can always be written about any time in the last 40 years, wither NATO, uh, and other things. So I'm going to uh, just hand it over to Peter and, and, uh, and Nick, and then after a, a suitable period of time, we'll uh, cut them off and hope to take your questions and uh, continue the conversation that way. So, Peter, Nick. All right. Do you want to? I thought it was going to be. Are, are, are you going to ask? I thought you were going to. I thought you were going to ask each other questions. Uh, you ask us questions. Why don't you start? Ask us the first. questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. I thought you guys were totally self-contained, oh. a sort of a roadshow <laughs> self-contained unit. But that's fine. <laughs> I mean, I'll so, ask Peter questions. Yeah. Well, then I, I, I would actually, honestly, like to start with the news from last night, the president's speech. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, the, it is inevitable that we compare what's happening now to Vietnam, um, and and I know it's kind of cheesy and and uh, conventional, but it, it also inescapable. And I believe the president even um, uh, flicked at it in his speech last night. So I, I want to just kind of open up with a, a general question about whether. Um, in ways that are healthy as well as unhealthy, our experience about Vietnam uh, is helping to shape both the policy that's been created and the way that policy is being uh, uh, accepted by both sides of the uh, uh, on the uh, on both sides of the political aisle. Peter. Um. Well, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Actually, something I, I I spent some time looking at for the book that. I have coming out next year was in fact the the kind of the rise and fall of the Vietnam analogy. And what's really fascinating is you see the Vietnam analogy is just everywhere during the debate over the Gulf War. Um, uh, you, uh, it's just absolutely omnipresent. Uh, it is extremely, also extremely influential, constantly in the air in the debate about Bosnia in 1995. It starts to dip uh, 
um, in the debate about Kosovo. And then by 2002, it's really remarkable how few references there are, actually are. For, for instance, in the Gulf War, John Kerry, uh, when he makes his speech opposing the Gulf War, mentions Vietnam like 15 times. When he makes his speech on the Senate floor supporting the Iraq War, he mentions Vietnam only once. And you think about you know, what an influence Vietnam had on John Kerry. So, and what's fascinating about Afghanistan now is that I think we've seen the, res the resurgence of the Vietnam analogy. So people are talking about Vietnam constantly now, much more than they were actually talking about Vietnam on the eve of the Iraq War, which is, I think is a sign, again, the right of a kind of the cycles of American self-confidence. When America is not militarily self-confident, not as economically and ideologically self-confident, we tend to talk a lot about Vietnam. I, I thought, actually, one of my favorite parts of Obama's speech was when he took on the Vietnam analogy, because I think that mm -hmm. While all analogies are flawed in various ways, I think this one um, has been partic is particularly flawed. It's gotten more has gotten more attention than it really deserves because I think the differences are really more important than the similarities. And I think Obama pointed to them. I think the most important difference is South Vietnam was not a country. South Vietnam was an entirely artificially create as entirely an artificial creation uh, that that uh, that was basically trying to prevent. A, com a, national, a communist movement that had taken over a nationalist movement in, in, in Vietnam from controlling the whole country. We were fighting against a, f a movement in the, in the Viet Cong and the NLF that was basically, basically dominated Vietnamese nationalism and claimed the mantle of Vietnamese nationalism. The Taliban, uh, although in some ways they're a difficult enemy to fight, really do not own Afghan nationalism in any kind of the same way that the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese essentially owned Viet, uh, Vietnamese nationalism by having been the forces that had fought against the French and the Japanese. And I think that's a fundamental difference. The Afghanistan, although a very decentralized country, is a country in a way that South Vietnam wasn't. I mean, we couldn't build a government in South Vietnam because we couldn't build a country in South Vietnam because the Vietnamese never wanted their country to be partitioned in the first place. There are lots of problems in Afghanistan, but I think it does have a much stronger national identity than South Vietnam. Vietnam did. Um, where I think the analogy is actually more interesting and apt is to think about Obama's position in Afghanistan vis-a-vis -vis the position that Richard Nixon was in when he came in in the latter stages of Vietnam. And I've written about this a little bit for a piece that I have coming out in time tomorrow. Um, and, and what's interesting about Nixon, right, Nixon of Vietnam, Nixon comes in and looks at the United States and says, look, we're running out of gas. The American people are not going to support this for very much longer. We don't have the, we, we're no longer in a situation where we can write a blank check here in terms of lives or, or, or money. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to escalate in a really, really ferocious way as a mask for my de-escalation. So what is he? Bombs the hell out of them, um, brutally, viciously, ferociously, um, but essentially as a mask for the, the gradual the gradual uh, end of U.S. ground presence in Vietnam, in the hope that that by bombing so much, it will be, he can he can start to withdraw the U.S. ground troops, uh, and 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 and, we, and and without us losing the war. And in a way, I think Obama is doing something similar. He's essentially. There's this short-term injection of power into Vietnam, but it's within, I mean, in Afghanistan, but it's within a larger story of essential American de-escalation um, and withdrawal. And that's why I'm ultimately kind of pessimistic that in this very, very short window that he's imagining that we're going to have this surge, surge is going to start next year and then, start, then basically end the year after, that we're really going to be any more effective in, in influencing the long-term course of the Afghan war than Nixon was with his short-term infusion of, of, of ferocious bombing of the North. Um, I think that's all very astute, and I think we should go back to a few of those points you mentioned at the end. Um, I tend to, uh, because I've just written this book on Nitsa and Kennan and I'm immersed in the book tour for it, I tend to view most of the answers in the context of what Nitsa and Kennan thought. Um, and so if you use the Vietnam analogy for Afghanistan, the one moment to look at is Kennan's famous 1966 testimony about the Vietnam War. And he goes up there and he, force, he explains what's going to happen. It's a very important moment for America because this calm, wise, bald man in an you know, elegant suit is criticizing the war effort. He's not a you know, crazy man with long hair, and it's a huge event on national television. And if you go into the speech and you look at his criticism and what he saw was going to happen, part of it was understanding the way that communism and nationalism interacted in Vietnam in a way people didn't then. But part of it was something that I think um, people don't remember as much, which is Kennan's, Kennan's realism. Kennan's sense that one of the reasons why we shouldn't be engaged in Vietnam is not just because it's you know, not a country, not just because we're not really fighting communists or fighting nationalists, but the reason not to be engaged is because it's 
you know, generally we fail. Generally, it's really hard to influence events on other sides of the world. We think we can. We have lots of confidence. We're the United States of America. We can do this. We can shape this part of the world for the better. But actually, most of the time, we can't. Most of the time, it backfires. And so that's Kennan's view then. And it's something in the last interview he gave in his life was about the Iraq War, where he makes the same point, where he says, you know, we know where we start. We don't know where we end. Uh, and there was a great skepticism. It wasn't isolationism. It was skepticism as to whether America can actually wrench the world around the way it wants. So if you take that to Afghanistan, it calls for much more caution. It calls for trying to figure out what exactly our national interests are. Our national interests, you know, it, it's not complete disengagement because, of course, we need to, you know, limit, you know, limit al-Qaeda forces who would be preparing for a strike against the United States. Of course, we should try to help Pakistan, but it certainly wouldn't include rebuilding the Karzai government, which, you know, we probably can't do. You know, we are just, the United States just is incapable of doing it. We don't understand the world well enough. They, you know, they don't necessarily even want our people doing that. So I think one of the ideas of the Cold War, so it was sort of a dissident idea that ran through the Cold War and that Kennan pushed and that other smart people pushed, has been lost, and that, or not lost, but has been, has not been thought back upon. And to rephrase it, when we look back at the Vietnam analogy, we tend to look at very specific things. We tend to say, well, the countries are different, and this is different, and this is different. The analogy doesn't work. But the bigger lesson is that what we did didn't work. Shouldn't that make us skeptical about what we are doing now and whether it will work? And I think that's an important thing that we need to pull forward. And Obama, you know, he was very cautious last night, and you could tell from his demeanor. His demeanor was something of the, of the kind that Kennan would have liked. And the, you know, the, la the pulling back on, you know, predator strikes that, you know, happened in the last couple of months. That's something that I think Kennan would have liked. Um, but I think he also would have cautioned, he would have uh, wanted us to be much more cautious about that engagement. Can I ask a question, actually, Nick, on the predator strikes? This is a small part, but do you think Kennan really would have been against the predator strikes? I mean, because we do know that Kennan had this, this nasty side, right? I mean, this side where he was very involved in covert action, you know, very yeah. supportive, of, very aggressive, very you know, covert, some very, very nasty covert action stuff. He doesn't seem to have been terribly concerned. I mean, the problem with the predator strikes, as I understand it, is, you know, is that basically they kill a lot of civilians, um, but they don't really endanger us very much. I right. mean, <laughs> so, um, so there's a, I wonder whether those predator strikes, which to some degree is the way the Obama administration for a while seemed to be going, yeah. You know, by rationing them, might not have really appealed to Kennan's kind of bloodless side. It doesn't force us to be engaged on the ground, um, which is the kind of thing he doesn't like. It's not involved in trying to shape, reshape the society. The costs are low. It's terrible for the, I think, for the people of, of Afghanistan and Pakistan. But maybe that would have appealed to Kennan as a kind of low-cost strategy, in the same way he basically liked covert action to try to keep the so to try to try to peel away potentially Eastern Europe and keep the Soviets on their heels. That's a, that's a, it's a great question because it gets at the part of the complexity of Ken, which is interesting for this debate. And yes, he loved covert action, um, particularly when he could help design it. He, was, um, he helped you know, create the covert action wing of the CIA and then decided he didn't like it once you know, Forstall expanded it and he took it away from Ken and having his hand on it. Um, he certainly would not have cared that we were killing civilians for the sake of the civilians because he, you know, he was a you know, not, not bloodthirsty, but he was not an entirely, he was not a, you know, a compassionate man for the sake of compassion. However, he would have cared a lot about the influence on the country and the people turning against us. And if he were to make the judgment that Obama made, that the predator strikes, despite their benefits, were turning so much of the country against us that they were hurting our interest, I think he would have made that judgment and I think he would have opposed them. But he would not have opposed them because, for the reasons that many people oppose them, mm -hmm. because they're covert and because we dislike killing civilians, he would have disliked them for the effect they've had. That's my guess. This uh, uh, example of my thinking that these guys could ask better questions <laughs> than I, uh, but I will do my best to ask the next one, and, and that is kind of an elemental one, and that is the Cold War was based around the notion of containing a state, a massive uh, empire um, with a fixed army and so forth. Um, the reason we're in Afghanistan is in part insurgency, but fundamentally uh, to oppose a shadowy terror network. Um, is there anything uh, to be learned from the Cold War and from the containment notion uh, when facing a shadowy terror network? I, I, I think the anal this one, I think, uh, the, the analogy of containment, I think, works extremely well for al-Qaeda and changes the way I think we should have thought about al-Qaeda during, um, during the Bush years. 
And, you know, the notion of containment is that you don't have to go in and roll the Soviet Union back. You don't have to overthrow the governments of Eastern Europe. You don't have to replace the government in Moscow. We don't even want to be running that place. We need to contain them. Eventually, they will collapse on their own weight. Now, that notion applied to al-Qaeda would have suggested we don't actually need to go and kill them all. This is a you know, bankrupt ideology. We need to prevent them from doing damage to us, but they could eventually destroy themselves. And then there are other things. You know, if you look at the early conception of, of containment, one of the things that Kennan talks about in the 1940s in his, his speeches is what you need to do is you need to figure out all the lines where the communists disagree with each other. You need to figure out all the sort of lines of internal dissent, and we need to put our maximum effort into maximizing those, make them fight each other. So if you apply that to containment and to al-Qaeda, find the fissures, find the different groups that dislike each other, and then do what you can covertly. Now, this is extremely complicated and it gets very messy, but try to get them to fight each other, and that's part of containment. So his conception of political containment, which is you use all your political tools to disrupt the organization, the opponent politically, I think actually works a lot uh, when you think about containment. And containment also, I mean, it, you, you can't really apply that notion that well to the, to the war in Afghanistan, except where it overlaps with what I was previously talking about. But you can apply it to Iran, which is something we can talk about later. But Peter, why don't you talk, take a crack at Al-Qaeda? I think the problem is, what are you containing? I mean, we tend to have this, we kind of tend to imagine that there was a consensus about what America was containing. There was a pretty broad consensus about containment. I mean, there were people who wanted rollback. But they ended up being by the Eisenhower, by the, when, when Eisenhower rejected that idea, which was prevalent on the intellectual right. Basically, ro- th- then then there was a pretty strong containment consensus. Right. Rollback was a kind of marginal idea in policy circles. But the thing was that containment itself was such a broad church that it could mean radically different things. Because the question was, what are you containing? So there were some people like Kennan who believed you were containing one country, one government. You were containing the Soviets. In fact, Kennan maybe, you know, Nicholas Nicholas knows better than either, Kennan really might have only believed that it applied to Stalin's Soviet Union. Um, And so for Kennan, you didn't need to contain communism. In fact, it's great. A lie with the Yugoslavs, which he was thrilled about, against against the Soviets. A lie with the Chinese. Don't worry about communist countries in backwaters like Vietnam. They're not going to ultimately be holding be beholden to the Soviet Union. Kennan did not really see us primarily as, 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 as containing an ideology. Uh, he saw us as containing one country. Um, on the other hand, you had people with a much, much broader conception who basically said we have to fight Vietnam because we have to contain communism everywhere around the world because every, every, every victory for communism will be in a victory for Soviet power and a threat to the United States. And it seems to me in many ways, we are engaged and have been since 9-11 in that same debate about how, the breadth of the enemy that we face. Right. There's a really good parallel you can draw there between containing the Soviet Union and containing communism. You know, the narrow is the Soviet Union, the broad is communism, and then containing al-Qaeda or containing you know, the war on terror, which means we have to combat a much larger swath. And Kennan certainly would have wanted to deal with the smaller swath, uh, you know, deal with just with probably Stalin's Soviet Union, and he probably would have just wanted to deal with al-Qaeda. Exactly. In fact, this is the central argument I make in my piece that comes out in the cover of Time tomorrow, that basically what Obama is doing is essentially trying to downsize the definition of our enemy in the same way that in different ways Nixon and Carter had to wrestle with trying to downsize the definition of what we were trying to contain when we realized that we couldn't contain global communism in the wake of Vietnam. And, um, and so I think he's ultimately, I think, he's, 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 I think he is listening uh, in a way to exactly the kind of advice, or trying to, that Nick, T- Nick Thompson is, he, is giving, which is I think, I, think, I think he wants to try to bring, I think for Obama, the original sin of Bush administration foreign policy was not making the war on terror specifically focused on al-Qaeda, but gradually expanding and expanding it so we're fighting Hezbollah and Hamas and Iran and Syria and the Taliban, all of these movements that require different strategies and that are not naturally allies of, of, of al-Qaeda. I think the, the, diff- the Kennan view, which I think is closer to the Obama view, would, view, would see min, many of these movements as having their own particular national and tribal right. interests. The, 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 the more neoconservative view, which was very strong in the, in, during the Cold War in the 70s and 80s and is still strong today, puts much more emphasis on ide- ideology. It says, no, 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 there is something called jihadist terrorism or Islo- Islamofascism or whatever that means that, that the Taliban is really very much like al-Qaeda and even Iran in some important ways are like al-Qaeda and we should see them this as an ideological war that we have to understand as us fighting this broad ideological enemy. I think Bush really believed that. 
I think, uh, I think Obama doesn't, and I think this is part of the transition that he, in a very difficult way, I think is trying to make. And there's a very relevant historical moment, which is Truman gives a speech outlining the Truman Doctrine, which says, if people are fighting for democracy, we will come to their aid. And Cannon, who at this point, you know, he opposes almost, he opposes a lot of what the government is doing at this point, including the Truman Doctrine. And he writes a memo saying, if we say, well, we will oppose communists wherever they are and support Democrats, every time there is a civil conflict, one side will say, hey, there's some communists in the bushes. Will you give us money? And that was true. Uh, and it's also true if you apply to the war on terror, which is, hey, you know, in Colombia, you know, the FARC, they're terrorists. You know, that's part of the war on terror. And that's kind of an absurd example that we didn't buy. Maybe a better example would be – or. Um, would be in Uzbekistan, or it would be perhaps in Somalia, where clan rivalry is turning into you know, a war against al-Qaeda and people who could really threaten us. Now, do the al-Qaeda-affiliated people in Somalia really threaten the United States in the way the al-Qaeda in Pakistan and Afghanistan do? No. And so you need to set your priorities based on the, the narrow understanding of it. But a question for you, Peter. I agree with, as uh, probably is clear from what I've just said, I totally agree with the principle of downsizing the enemy. Um, and I agree that Obama has been talking that way and downsizing. And I agree is a very different policy from Bush. But what about the speech last night and the expansion of troops has convinced you that we're downsizing? Wouldn't downsizing have been more taking the original view that was articulated as sort of the Biden position, that we need to just focus on al-Qaeda and not send a massive influx to try to help rebuild the Karzai government? Well, that's what I think is, is strange in some ways perhaps incoherent about the Obama position. It's true. He has agreed to send the troops. On the other hand, he really has narrowed our goals. I mean, if you yeah. look at the three goals that he lays out, he says, prevent al-Qaeda from having a safe haven. Well, that you could probably do just with the Biden policy, of basically lots of drone strikes, smaller number of people on the ground. Then he says we have to keep, we have to basically stop their momentum, break their mom the Taliban's momentum, that's a pretty it's always kind of modest, I mean, idea. I mean, it's basically saying that we should prevent the status quo from getting a lot worse. And he says we have to prevent them from uh, overthrowing the government in Kabul, which I think most people agree you could probably probably do with a more modest force. Um, and uh, and and we and, and then he says we have to basically ultimately reconcile with the Taliban. So um, uh, which he said last night, and others have said in even stronger format. So I mean, again, the reason I I think about the Nixon analogy, it seems to me. What Nixon was in a strange trying to do was he was trying to bloody the enemy um, in the short term. But the longer term strategy was essentially we were ratcheting back our goals for what we were expecting to get out of the Vietnam War pretty fast. Um, and, um, and, he was tr and, and ultimately, I think that seems to me kind of if you take Obama – you have this is all interpretation, but my interpretation seems to, would would be that uh, for me the body language and the rhetoric of the speech, what was really striking was how – was how minimal the goals were. I mean, there was virtually nothing in the speech about our vision of Afghanistan, our obligations to the Afghan people, what society we want to create there. Uh, the, the, there was a clear distinction that he made again and again between al-Qaeda and the Taliban, which is something you've been hearing coming out of the administration uh, in, in various ways over the past few months. So that's my – I could be wrong. I think there's clearly a divide inside the administration on this. But that would be my kind of my kind of reading of it. So Obama is like Nixon, and that's a good thing to summarize. Uh, I think uh, you know. I, I guess I would say uh, oh, I think Obama has certain Nick, certain Nixonian tendencies. But I think for me, the lesson of that is, in some ways, we in, we put too much emphasis on our characterological assessments of presidents, and, and 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 whereas in many ways, presidents are really shaped by the circumstances they're in. So even were McCain in office, I think he would have to be doing at least some of these moving in some of these same directions. Because ultimately, we're just at such a fundamentally different point than we were in 2002 and 2003 in terms of the sense of, the, the, of, of how much of the resources we can afford to spend, the public will, and the sense of the efficacy of our military power that I think it would push almost anyone in that direction. There's a – bring it back to, to Nixon for a second. It's – Kennan once wrote that nobody understands my conception of containment better than Nixon, uh, Nixon and Kissinger. Uh, he really did believe that they were closer than any other government, including the Kennedy administration, carrying out what he believed America's foreign policy should be, which is surprising to a lot of people who think of Kennan as this as this great liberal. But it's just for the reasons that that Peter described. Yeah, and if you look, if you think about that realist lineage, Kissinger to Scowcroft, who was his aide, to the, to the children and grandchildren of, of Scowcroft and Kissinger. What's, always in, what's interesting about that tradition is that in some ways has migrated from the Republican Party into the Democratic Party. Right. It's at least as well represented. I mean, there are people like Richard Haas who are still officially in the Republican Party. But if you think about Gates uh, or you think about James Jones, 
these are people who I think can be understood to some degree within that realist lineage. And just in some ways as the neoconservatives famously migrated from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, I think there has been a little bit of this migration of realists from the Republican Party into the Democratic Party. And so that's why I think you can see some of that tradition going from a, a Kissinger and Scowcroft through to, a, to an Obama well, and, and the people around him. George Bush, the previous president, was clearly an idealist in his, mm -hmm. you know, his sense of how America could change the world and how it could shape it. So his opponents would you know, naturally gravitate towards realism. Yeah, so that's, that's probably why that's, that happened. That's right. That's right. No more great questions? <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, extend the containment frame to another area of the world that uh, is giving us problems, and that is Iran. Uh, we have now an Iran that's looking uh, different than it looked to us a year ago, a, a, a more militarized Iran, a, a more totalitarian Iran, um, an Iran that is um, perhaps closer to nuclear weapons. And we've gone through the um, trial period of, of outreach uh, to Iran and, and not had a, uh, any demonstrable success. Um, it's still very murky, but the question then becomes, uh, uh, I mean, even Mike Gerson today in the Washington Post was um, more or less admitting that if George Bush um, uh, didn't think military action in Iran was possible, um, it's inconceivable that, that you can imagine Barack Obama uh, committing military force to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. So does the history of containment... Uh, provide a way for us to think about um, the next steps with Iran? Um, I would say definitely. Um, and I think um, what if you were to apply the lessons in history of containment, you can come up with a fairly coherent Iran policy. Maybe the wrong one, but it would go something like this. The first point is that um, it's fine, if, or not fine, but you know, a lot of people say it's unacceptable if Iran gets a nuclear weapon. Well, <laughs> I mean, the uh, containment would say it's actually it's acceptable, and not only that, it's probably going to happen, and our efforts to stop it may be accelerating it by you know, in increasing Iranian nationalism. So accept that they could get it. And then once they have it, then try to contain it. Okay, now what does that mean? The Soviet Union contained their territorial and ideological ambitions. With Iran, it would be you know, uh, clamp down on them as much as possible with sanctions, try to prevent their ability to influence and work with other allied groups, try to isolate them as much as possible. And then, as with Kennan's early conception of containment, hope that if you can do all of these things, and if you can prevent them from gaining political power, prevent them from gaining financial strength, they will crumble. And that really what you have to hope for is not that you can push them back, beat them back, or really or blow up their missile uh, sites. It's that eventually, if you wait, because we have stronger ideas, because we have a smarter ide ideology, because people are more likely to want to live under a system like ours than a system like theirs, eventually the forces that we support there will rise up. And you can probably, through covert means, you know, encourage them as best you can. So that is that is a coherent policy. It may be wrong because of the dangers of Iran getting a nuclear weapon, particularly proliferation in that region. But it's certainly a coherent policy and one that uh, should be talked about. And I think it's a useful way of framing that option. Yeah, I guess one, quite, one way to think about it is, do you think Iran is more like Stalin's Soviet Union or more like Brezhnev's Soviet Union? Because in a way, I mean, I, I think how you define... Con doesn't people define containment in different ways, but I tend to think of containment as a situation, a policy you adopt because you believe that basically there can be no meaningful negotiations. There can be no meaningful diplomacy that will settle your outstanding disputes. That if that, that you, re you resort to containment because basically you believe that you're not really going to get anywhere, but you're not going to be able to, there's an unbridgeable divide. You don't want to go to war, but, um, but you can't have normal diplomatic relations. And so, um, the the counter view with Iran would be um, don't take the containment view that we took uh, against Stalin's Soviet Union, but try to think more about what the U.S. did vis-a-vis -vis Iran during Brezhnev's Soviet Union and the whole the West did, particularly led by West Germany and Ostpolitik in the 1970s, which was really to say rather than isolating Iran, can you engage Iran, open Iran more to the outside world? 
in this in some of the ways that the Helsinki Accords did, um, and in that way actually strengthen the liberal elements in Iran by making Iran more economically transparent, by by integrating it more into the into the into the global economy, and and in that way could you have a kind of thaw that would ultimately that would strengthen the very you know the strong uh, civil society and liberal elements that are that that exist, even though they're often kind of pushed down in Iran. It seems to me, I'm not an Iran expert, so I'm not, I'm not sure, but it seems to me these, this is a somewhat yeah. different model. And of course, then there's a third model that I think Nick is, I think, rightly rejecting, which is in fact the model of, of rollback itself, which would either be the model of preventive war, which was the model that the United States did not follow vis-a-vis -vis first the Soviet Union and then China when they got nuclear weapons. Um, but that would be that would be that would be another another kind of lesson to draw another another image to draw from the Cold War. So the policy differences between the variation of containment that I laid out and your proposed policies for Iran would be would, have, would be détente basically. Détente, right? That makes that makes lots of sense. Of course, the Iranians have a say in this, so I mean, you know. <laughs> right. Let's get a little political here. Um, during the period of containment, as you said, by the middle of the Eisenhower era, the rollback advocates had been marginalized. Um, there was this baggy containment consensus within which um, there was a lot of disagreement, but uh, a general sense of, a, of, of broad strategic agreement. But more importantly, there were partners on either side of the aisle that could hash out strategy. There were um, uh, moderate, realist Republicans, um, uh, liberal centrist Democrats, Jack Kennedy Democrats, Walter Mondale Democrats, and within some uh, 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 spectrum of uh, uh, back and forth, uh, business could be done. Um, there are, as you said, fewer and fewer realist Republicans. Um, uh, and although the, the president will uh, likely uh, get and certainly have to rely on Republican votes for his Afghan policy, um, has the ground politically and ideologically in this country shifted such that you can't have a bipartisan containment-like Cold War foreign policy today? Um, well, this is something that's relevant to my, my book topic. So the part of the, you know, my book is about Paul Nitzan, George Kennan, and the hawk and the dove, and they're obviously, you know, very different people, but they maintain, uh, they maintain a friendship and they're cordial throughout the Cold War. They're able to communicate um, in a way that I, I don't see um, happening today. I can't think of any parallels of people crossing lines. Perhaps the more important parallel is you look, just look at the life of Nitze, who, um, he's my grandfather, full disclosure. Um, the, I think my, my favorite fact about him is that he worked for every president from Roosevelt to Bush, and at one point or other was fired or demoted by Roosevelt, uh, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Bush. Right? So he's, he has the capacity to work for everybody, to be fired by everybody, and to be rehired by everybody. And part of that is that he was never aligned ideologically. He was never really a Republican. Or he claimed to be a Democrat and would go to the Democrat conventions. But he certainly fought with Democrats, fought with Republicans. He was his own kind of independent party. And those people are helpful to debates because they can realign. You can get new coalitions. You can get a realist coalition that comes to the fore at a certain point. Um, and I think they're rarer today. It's not as though that's the good old years and it was, there was no partisanship and everybody was independent and these are terrible and everybody's partisan and no one's independent. But I think it was more prevalent then. And I think now, um, because of the partisanship, we have people that are more tracked on Republican and Democratic lines. And we're obviously seeing that um, in, in Washington right now. And that's Unfortunate, but not insurmountable. I mean, we'll see in the Afghanistan debate. Uh, Obama's clearly going to pick up lots of Republicans who are going to, you know, work with his policy. People are going to. It won't be entirely party line uh, based as the healthcare debate is. I, I think that the bi we may exaggerate the degree of bipartisan consensus that really existed during the Cold War. Yeah. I mean, I think if there was a bipartisan consensus, it starts before the Cold War. I think the key moment is really 1940 when Franklin Roosevelt brings in Henry Stimson. Um, and, and, and Frank Knox, and basically the Teddy Rose, the, the, the internationalist 
Teddy Roosevelt wing of the Republican Party. Um, uh, and, and, and that creates this bipartisan, wise men uh, c- kind of uh, internationalist consensus that then in the next generation is the kind of the best and the brightest, you know, the kind of McGeorge Bundys. Who knows what party McGeorge Bundy and Rock, Robert McNamara really are anyway. Um, but in a way, this was in, if you want to take a darker view, we tend to kind of look at this with, with rose colored glasses, and it, it looks, it's a much nicer story when you're talking about 1940 or even 1948 or the 1950s than it is when you have a bipartisan international consensus that essentially brings us into Vietnam. So, there's a darker way of looking at that story, which was that the, it was an internationalist consensus that was forged in response to the leg to Munich and Pearl Harbor, that was always based in some ways on on keeping foreign policy very far away from the masses. And the, it was first it was it was it was first based on a total marginalization of the isolationist right, um, even though the isolationist right in some ways Taft had some important critiques of the growing of the growth of, exa- of the imperial presidency. Um, it, was to, it was based on a marginalization of the Henry Wallace left, which believed that you could continue to co- cooperate with the Soviet Union. Um, the, the, the populace itself, was these were, these were elitist people who were very, and I wish Jeremy Surrey was here because his book on Kissinger is so valuable. Yeah. He shows that this whole generation of people was very distrustful of democracy um, in a robust form, which was one of the points that one of the points that the new left made in its critique of them, and that the, pe- the people were always in some ways r- rising up and knocking at the door and saying, hey, wait, we want more of a say in this. We don't necessarily, that in some ways McCarthyism was an expression of that. And then you saw, and then the Goldwater movement was, and then the, and then the new left was in, in, in response to Vietnam. And so in some ways, I think it was always a somewhat unstable, elitist consensus that was based on marginalizing um, views that had root, strong roots out in the country, but basically couldn't find a way into the political system. And I think in that sense, um, we should be careful about these bipartisan, by, by these, because I think what they tend to do is they tend to be quite ideologically narrow, um, and they tend to often be, and this is a point that many people in the net roots have now made, is basically, well, actually, there was a pretty strong bipartisan consensus in 2002 and 2003 that the, the, almost all the national leaders of the Democratic Party supported the Iraq War, all the Republicans supported the Iraq War, and those people who were against it, whether they were the, uh, on, the, on the kind of the ancestors of the Henry Wallace, George McGovern left, or whether, in a way, they were on the ancestor, they were the kind of the Ron Paul, and, you know, children of the of the Robert Taft anti in, anti globalist right, were totally marginalized, and was in fact that such a healthy debate. So I think we should see this. Uh, I think we should we should see that there are downsides to this kind of bipartisan consensus as well. Right, consensus can lead to bipartisanship and friendliness can lead to bad things. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Um. I think we should open up this to the audience. Um, and uh, uh, do we have a, a, a – Ollie's got the, the microphone. Um, we're going to pass it around. If you um, uh, want to speak, speak into the microphone, ask uh, your question, and also um, give us your uh, affiliation if you have one um, uh, on, on any aspect of this. Um, uh, but uh, as you all are thinking about your questions, um, let me um, let me uh, go back to uh, 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 something that was in in today's uh, Washington Post uh, Al Kamen column. Uh, this is, I think, today or this week, the tenth anniversary of the handoff of the Panama Canal, and Al Kamen had a just a litany of quotes from. Trent Lott and and uh, a number of major Republican figures saying that the handoff of the Panama Canal <laughs> to China is is giving an absolutely crucial strategic asset to the communist Chinese uh, that will come back and you know, cause us grave ill and danger uh, henceforth. And um, obviously that hasn't happened. Um, uh, there was in this broadening out of the uh, of the vision of the threat of communism, uh, some long term uh, shifting in in ideology of uh, of what what major elements of, uh, of the governing uh, 
uh, uh, philosophy of, of, of major public figures have uh, in seeing threats? Has, are, are we still stuck with that today? Do we still have, uh, at least on, on one side of the aisle, and I don't mean to be partisan about this, uh, uh, an inclination to broaden out uh, the threats we have? And are we um, really one incident away, one terrorist attack away from uh, one incident with China away from, from this coming to the fore? I think so. I think so. I mean, I think that the, the natural inclination of most people in the Republican Party is to see the world as defined by conflict um, and, uh, or the potential for conflict and to see the possibilities of international cooperation as fairly limited. Um, uh, 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 and, uh, and, um, and, and, and to take a very dark view uh, of, of human nature as it applies to America's enemies. Um, and to not basic, I think the f- most fundamental divide between liberal and conservative foreign policy is basically that I think conservatives are simply much more likely to see foreign policy as a zero sum game, and 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 people like Obama are actually much more than people like George W. Bush, the true ancestors of Woodrow Wilson, because they basically they believe much more than in fact foreign policy is not zero sum, that there is something called collective security and common interest. Obama mentions that all the time, and so I think that's right. I think sooner or later American foreign policy, the debate is going to shift towards Asia more than it is today. I think we've been in a weird... It was already moving there on the eve of 9-11. If you, if you looked about the debate about China in the first eight months of the Bush administration over the EP3, and I think eventually it's going to move there, and I think, I think the right is going to orient itself to, in a significant way around a more hawkish stance on China. It'll be a little complicated by the fact that the business community won't Will be won't be there, and that will play itself out. In, so that will be a different way that it plays itself yeah. out from the Soviet Union. But I still think that the right's hawkish tendencies will really play itself out. Let me just, but uh, and I think it will be, un, and I think they'll use the Cold War analogy, and I think it will be really unfortunate because I think actually to see the Soviet China as as similar to the Soviet Union at any phase is it, it, it really really misunderstands the nature of the of the of the of the challenge we face. Let me just say one other point there, just about the Palinol Canal, because I think it's important. It's hard to do in some ways because some of the things he said since his presidency, but I actually think that Democrats need to defend Jimmy Carter uh, more than they do. Um, see, what happens is that there's this story that you say if you're a Democratic presidential candidate, which is I'm the, I'm the – they don't mention Wilson, which I think is interesting. I think they probably should mention Wilson because actually he's more relevant in some ways I think, than any of them. But they say, I am in the tradition of Franklin Roosevelt and, Har- and Harry Truman and John F. Kennedy. And then it cuts off at Kennedy. Oh. That's convenient, isn't it? Uh, we never had a president named Lyndon Johnson, um, which in some ways shows the blindness to the dangers of the Truman-Kennedy containment tradition. But then you never. But then Carter is 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 someone we will we will never. We basically concede that Carter was a disaster, which 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 plays very importantly into the Cold War conservative net right Republican narrative, which is crucial to understanding how conservatives think today. Which is that we were losing the Cold War in the 1970s. We were losing in the Carter administration. We had lost confidence in ourselves. We got all caught up in the sense that there were all these limits to American power. Ronald Reagan came in, restored our self confidence, said, "What? Well, it's ridiculous. There are no limits to our power." And then we won the Cold War. I think that's not. I think that's not true. I think America was not losing the Cold War during the Carter administration. I think the best historical stuff, at least that I've looked at, is, you know, uh, suggests that if you look at the, the gains that the Soviet Union made in Angola, in Ethiopia, they didn't amount to very much. That the central core struggle was basically we, we, we were we were winning because the Soviet Union's economy was starting to tank in the 1970s, and that. And that the Carter did some things that are really valuable and were politically courageous. The pa- giving up the Panama Canal, which was a huge political blow to him, I think, and, and signing the Camp David Accords, which was, I think, very, very valuable for Israeli security. And the unwillingness to defend Carter at all essentially is he allows conservatives to, ha- to, in an uncontested way, have this narrative uh, about how the 1970s were like the 1930s and Ronald Reagan was like Winston Churchill. Uh, and I think that is, in some ways, really central to a lot of the, the, the weakness of liberal arguments in foreign policy even to this day. And the single most damaging thing the Soviet Union did, the invasion of Afghanistan, happened under Carter. So you give, give him credit for that, whether it's... That's right, and the and, and the view that the, the view that the that the neocons had, which was that the that Afghanistan was a prelude to the Soviet Union trying to take the oil fields of the Persian Gulf, I think turns out to be nonsense. Uh, in fact, the Af- I mean, Afghanistan war was not uh, as the, in the way it was perceived to be by the American right this apocalyptic thing which showed that the Soviet Union was in fact going to take over the whole Middle East. It turned out to be a much more limited engagement, and of course also a tremendously self-defeating one.
Um, I want to go back to the China thing for a second. There's a, a anecdote which is interesting. Is that uh, I mean, of, of, of course, Paul's premise is right. Of course, the you know a dark view of the world sells politically. If you think of we have bad enemies out there, it makes us feel better. It works in campaigns. You know, war is good business. My day job is as an editor at Wired Magazine, and so a couple weeks ago, um, you know, whenever there's a big cyber report, it, you know, somebody, some TV station says, will you come and talk about the, the threat of hackers? Um, and so I get one, and you know, it's, the report is, you know, it's from a congressional committee, and it says that Chinese hackers have infiltrated the Defense Department, and you know, they're planning to attack us, and they've got these war plans, and they've set up, you know, these are the systems they're going to knock down first. And at the top of the report, it says, you know, commissioned by the congressional committee on something or other. And you go through it, and you realize actually the report's written by Northrop Grumman. You look online, and Northrop Grumman sells the Defense Department all of their anti-hacking systems, right? So you have um, – it shows – it's, you know, one small example of, you know, why some of the hype and the fear about China comes from motives which may not necessarily be completely salutary. Um, back to Carter for a second. I want to ask you, Peter, a general question, which is one of the – you know, you've praised realism. You've praised um, Nixon, Kennan, you know, as, as have I. One of the tenets of realism is that we really shouldn't care about human rights. They kind of get in the way. You know, in my, uh, going through my research, I found these conversations where Kennan is talking to Kissinger. And they're like, you know, Sakharov, oh my God, you know, think about what Stalin would have done to him. I mean, <laughs> nothing's happened to this guy getting in the way of everything. And, you know, there's this joking commentary as though human rights are this ridiculous sideshow that distracts us from what matters and we can't do anything about them either. Is that, do you think they were right? No, I don't. And I, str- I mean, I struggle w- with this. Uh, um, I- it seems to me, I guess, and maybe this is too easy an answer, is that the, g- the real value, even genius, of, of Cold War American foreign policy in its early conception re- was that it was and, – and, and FDR too, actually. I would start FDR and then I think that in, in, the, in the, ni- the 1940s foreign policy was that it was a fusion of liberalism and realism. It was more, had more of a realist element than did Wilson. It was more pessimistic about universal cooperation and more tolerant of spheres of influence than Wilson was. Um, uh, it, there was more of a recognition that ultimately that international law is probably a relatively flimsy thing and that, that international law is only as strong as the gun that can enforce it. And you see that in, in, in FDR's four policemen idea, which is a much more realist idea. Um, but still, even though re- FDR has very strong realist tendencies, Unlike Kennan, he really does see some value in these broad declarations, like the Atlantic Charter, even the Crimea Charter, which, which is you know the, it made, declared at Yalta throughout the World War II, and then throughout the early years of the Kennan, the, and with the, the the UN Declaration on Human Rights, and then with Helsinki, the U.S. is essentially kind of essentially sketching out visions of the world as we would like to be it, very idealistic visions, even as we essentially in some ways have to accommodate to the nasty realities. That's a very, very difficult balance, but I think the balance was really important. And so, and I, and I think Niebuhr was the person more than Kennan. Niebuhr didn't call himself a realist. He was uncom- even many people called him a realist. He was more uncomfortable with it because even though he recognized, like Kennan, that basically there was something, he believed in original sin, he believed that human beings were fallen and uh, creatures, he didn't want to kind of sanctify it. He wanted to believe that there could be some mysterious way in which we were redeemed by God's grace, to use his theological language. And I think that that kind of thing um, was also somewhat present in Roosevelt, the way Roosevelt talked, and in the way that Truman talked. And I think that was valuable and precious. Certainly precious and important for domestic politics, but also because the world is a mysterious place, and sometimes, even though what, everything that Kennan said might be true in the moment, I think there's this great line from Niebuhr that, I, where Niebuhr says, "You know, realities are always defeating ideals, but in the long term, sometimes ideals can play tricks on reality." You know, and I think you want to maintain that possibility, and it seems to me that's where I feel like Kennan becomes becomes too bleak for me. And I mean, and this ties into something Paul said, where if you talk about Democrats becoming more realist. Well, realism is, is easy when you're talking about war for liberals or Democrats because the skepticism about America's ability to succeed in its goals and the general desire to stay away from it, you know, that kind of matches with, you know, liberals not really liking war. But what about genocide? Um, you know, realists or like Kennan would say, well, you know, we probably really shouldn't get engaged. You know, we can unless it affects our national interest. You know, we'll probably mess it up and we shouldn't do that. And that's, you know, the opposite instincts, whereas, you know, liberals and people who you know, work for the magazines that Peter and I have worked for and, you know, go to the same schools and blah, 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 all are in favor of massive international interaction against genocide and against it on war. So how do, where does realism take you when you come from those, um, those beginnings? Yeah. I think it's also, 
it's hard to be consistently a consistent realist. I mean, I think you even find that realists like Kennan end up saying that he wants to kind of, you know, he wants a massive reduction, even abolition of nuclear weapons. And now Kissinger is saying that. I mean, Kissinger is, is talking, saying that we should, we should aspire to a world with no nuclear weapons. Henry Kissinger, I mean, I feel like there's a weird way in which something in the human spirit Ultimately, for most people, even those who are the most, the most, but you know, the kind of most cold-blooded, does want to hold out some kind of vision for a world that is fundamentally better. And I, I, I think that so. I think that sometimes tends to whale up, even in odd ways within realists themselves. You don't think Ken, uh, Kissinger's playing a trick where he will get the world reduced to zero and then he will reveal that he has won? <laughs> that, 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 that well could be it. All right. We do have some uh, questions here, Ali. This gentleman right here. Greg Thielman, Arms Control Association. Uh, last night, uh, President Obama spoke at West Point. Uh, in 2002, President Bush spoke at West Point. One of the things Bush uh, told the world was the U.S. was adopting a preventive war doctrine in which, in one of his formulations, uh, we have a right to attack another country if, it, if we assess it will pose a threat five years from now. Uh, this is really breathtaking. never happened uh, in, throughout the Cold War uh, in, any of, in any of our administrations. As far as I can tell, that's still officially the doctrine of the United States, uh, even under President Obama, even though everything that Obama says seems to me to point in a different direction. I guess my question is, do we expect sometime soon an explicit uh, revocation of that very expansive preventive war doctrine of, of the Bush administration under which we still live? <clears throat> I think that's a great question, and I think it's a really important one. It's something I've written a little bit about because it really raises the question of whether we still believe in deterrence. Uh, and you know, and deterrence had its critics on the left, and it had its critics on the right. But it, but there was a pretty wide swath of the center that basically that basically that believed in deterrence um, quite strongly. Uh, and, and 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 you're right. Bush basically said overnight. Sorry, deterrence may have worked then. It doesn't work now, not just against Al Qaeda, but it doesn't work against countries like Iraq and Iran and North Korea. The rationale for that was never particularly coherent or well thought out. Um, but you're, I think you're making an, a very important point, which is Democrats have not challenged that. Um, and in some ways, in some ways, we still live under those in the shadow of those assumptions. And it's it's very important to go back to what about Iran. I mean to have this debate about why exactly do we believe that we cannot deter Iran, given the costs of preventive war there. And I think that there's been a tremendous reluctance by not just Obama, but almost any Democrats to actually try to reopen that question. And, um, you know, it's funny, when I go back and you look at the – in some ways I think it's kind of – if you go back and look at the debates about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the internal debates in the Kennedy administration about preventive act, military action in Cuba, what's kind of sad in some ways to read them now is what you tend to find, what people said during those debates, which were really powerful, was we're not that kind of country. That was Japan during Pearl Harbor. That was the Japanese. America doesn't have this in our tradition, uh, like the Germans. We don't launch preventive wars. It was very important to, Ameri to America's self-conception that we didn't do this. Um, and it is really striking and, I think, disturbing that Bush essentially completely turned that up and said, no, no, no. We're not a country that waits to be attacked. We're a country that attacks first. Well, actually, it was very important to America's conception that we were not that kind of a country. Um, and, and I think we need to remember that older tradition, which was connected to international law, too. Uh, this gentleman right here. Uh, I'm Barry Stern. I, I don't work in the foreign policy area, although I had done some work for international aid development and Millennium Challenge Corporation and so forth. But um, I'm an educational consultant. Um, Two-part two, two question. Uh, the first is uh, we live in a kind of a different world today because of uh, great technological improvements, miniaturization, the Internet, uh, we have people can capitalize very cheaply on this and commit terrorist acts. Has that changed the foreign policy in your view? And, and, and related to that, um, whether you're talking about Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, uh, Western Europe has been pretty much missing in action. Uh, there's not a whole lot of help. You, you've fo sort of focused on American foreign policy, but these countries are not defending themselves. Uh, they, they are under the, the U.S. Uh, nuclear umbrella, and um, uh, if we were to act as a, as a unified Western uh, entity, whether it's NATO or whatever you call it, uh, 
are we being undermined by our European brethren across the ocean? Um, well, I'll, I'll start with point one, and there's, it's, it's kind of interesting in that your point is correct, and it refutes something that, or you know, pushes back against something I said earlier, which is because it is so easy to, um, because technology has enabled people to cause harm to the United States, as people have said a million times, the hijackers have box cutters. Um, because of that capacity, it has actually made it more important for us to be aware of small pockets of terrorist sympathy. So, you know, we, we drew this analogy, or Peter drew a very important analogy, where, you know, narrow version of containment goes after um, Soviet communism, the large version goes after communism in a large sense. You can draw the parallel today, where the narrow version, which we're both supporting, looks at al-Qaeda and people who really want to do us harm, and the larger version, you know, takes the war on terror as a larger enemy. Today, because of the capacity to do harm, you actually you have to pay more attention to small places that become terrorists than you used to be concerned about small places that become communist. So like if Malawi um, goes communist during the Cold War, it really doesn't matter at all. Um, if they become a, t a haven for al-Qaeda and allow people to train there and prepare terrorist attacks, it actually does matter. So in that sense, because of the technological change, it, it, it shifts this debate slightly. I still think the overall point about wanting to have the, the narrow the approach of taking a narrow enemy versus a broad enemy is still sensible and the right one to take. Do you want to answer the Europe part? Or? Oh, um, you know, I think the problem – I'm not necessarily sure that on the Iran sanctions point that our problems really have been with Western Europe. It seems to me that they've been really with the Russians and the Chinese. Um, you know, I, I think when you know, I think the problem is you have to be careful what you wish for. I mean, people say, "Well, it wouldn't be great if the, if the Western Europeans spent much, much more on their military, so we wouldn't have to spend as much on our military." Well, then they would be more politi geopolitically autonomous too. I mean, it's it's the fact that we spend so much that I think that we that means that we have this NATO structure where we basically call the shots pretty much. I mean, do we would we would be happier with a weaker? I mean, a lot of people at the end of the Cold War thought that NATO would dissolve and you would have a much more autonomous European. Uh, foreign policy and European military capacity. And uh, I think a lot of Americans would have been said very happy that that didn't happen. Um, and, that, that, you know, and so I think, again, I don't think you can have your cake and eat it too. If you want us to spend less and them to spend more militarily, I think it means that they're going to become more independent. Um, and, uh, uh, and Europe will become more of an independent geopolitical and mil even military entity. And I think that that would have real costs to America, at least if you kind of have this image that America should be the, the, you know, the world superpower and that we gain important benefits from that. I'm going to just piggyback on the question that you asked to get another question in the, that, that I, I think is relevant, and, and that is really picking up on what Peter said. Um, to some extent, you know, NATO was the, the main entity that, I don't know, you want to say won the Cold War, but was there uh, at the bulwark. Um, as Peter said, that there was an expectation that NATO would wither away. In fact, it became the unit uh, through which uh, the first dramas of a Cold War, uh, post-Cold War world, uh, were acted upon, and that was the Balkans. And, and Peter and I are both of an age where a lot of our thinking and reporting and so forth were fashioned in thinking through the Balkans. I, I, I think I, you know, you're at a certain age and certain wars that you're that you're engaged in. That becomes the lens through which you see the world. I think that's the lens through which Peter and I both wound up uh, uh, giving support to the invasion of Iraq because we saw it as part of a larger vision of uh, something other than uh, an atomized world, uh, a, a, an alliance world um, that could expand. And, you know, I think that there's still a lot of evidence that that that, that strategy is the right one, has legs. NATO is still involved in Afghanistan. I think the sub Rosa arguments there on by Obama is really, you know, a lot of this is we want to to expand, extend, strengthen these alliances because we don't want to have to do everything ourselves. And so so um I would be curious what you all think of the of of the future of, of alliances and in particular NATO going forward. NATO in uh, as a as a as a 
uh, a player in Afghanistan. NATO possibly is a player in the Middle East and elsewhere. Well, let me talk a little bit about the expansion of NATO, which is very interesting. It's one of those issues where at the end of the Cold War, there's a big debate, should we expand NATO? And this is a moment where Nitsa and Cannon agree. And they say, no, we should not expand NATO. And the reason is um, there's a split that's relevant today and that you're sort of choosing, when you talk about the expansion of NATO, you're choosing between Eastern Europe and Russia, which doesn't want NATO to be expanded. So the Poles and the Czechs really want NATO to be expanded because they're afraid of the, so of the Russians and the Russians really don't want it to be expanded. And Nitsa and Kennan's argument was um, the Russians are more important. Eastern Europe is not as important, therefore we should not expand NATO. We should do what the Russians want. And it is, I think, undeniably true that the expansion of NATO, which some people believe we promised we wouldn't do, is something that helped to turn Russia against us and is something that had consequ negative consequences. It also obviously had positive consequences. It may have you know, played a major role in the economic development we've seen in that region and the, you know, the, you know, the relative prospering we've seen in those regions. So was it the right thing or was it the wrong thing? I don't know, but it's clear that uh, it alienated Russia. Now, if you see Obama's move bringing, taking missile defense out of uh, Poland, out of, you know, out of the newly expanded NATO area, um, is something that has upset them and pleased the Russians. And that, I think, has had you know, benefits because right now, Russia is more important. We need them to help us deal with Iran. We need them to help us deal with North Korea. So in a way, when you make decisions about the expansion of NATO, you're choosing between whether you care about you know, side A or side B, and at different points in time, um, you weigh those two sides differently, and so you make different choices on that front. Yeah, you know, NATO expansion is one of the things that makes me just, just despair that I can ever get foreign policy decisions right. Because, you know, I feel like if you look at – I think NATO expansion has been a success. I mean, it's true Russia hasn't – you know, there's hostility. There's some problems with Russia, hostility to Russia. But I think you'd probably make a pretty good argument that Russia – the, one should have been pessimistic about Russia's chances of really, really being a robust democracy, even if we did everything right. And we have in Eastern Europe, I mean, if given the way what people imagine Eastern Europe might be like in the early 1990s, has been a really, you know, and even with the economic difficulties they have now, you know, it's been a remarkable success story. I mean, you know, it's hard to remember back in the early 90s. I mean, I still remember, you know, people said, oh, you know, it's going to be like the interwar years. You know, it's going to be like when all these countries got their independence after at Versailles. They're going to be fighting with one another. Huge conflict between the Hungarians and the Romanians, ethnic, uh, you know, revanchism, and look at what happens in the Balkans. And it's really been a tremendous success story. And, and yet all the experts basically said don't do it. Um, and the people who were pushing it were basically defense lobby. They wanted to sell arms to these guys and, you know, some ethnic voters in the Midwest who had a commitment to Poland. And I mean, everything you know about process would have said, you know, for goodness sake, listen to the experts. Don't just be steamrolled by some cheap political arguments. And yet I think it's, it's actually basically, it's basically been a success story of uh, the expansion of Eastern Europe. So for me, it's, um, for me, it's humbling. I mean, the question about NATO's future, I guess for me, the basic, the big question or problem I have no answers to is that, we have these institutions that have been quite successful, but they don't really – institutions seem to me to be successful, have to have, some, have to have a good relationship with the actually existing balance of power in the world. And that, you know, FDR was, I think, in retrospect, looks like a genius for having pushed China on the Security Council at a time when China was very, very, very weak. I mean, he probably thought it was just going to be – Chiang Kai-shek was just going to be an adjunct of the United States, but in retrospect – how think, think you know? Imagine if China were not on the Security Council. The kind of problems we would have in the world then if they were outside of this body. But the problem is, you have a, NATO is not less and less corresponds to the actual balance of power in the world. You know, with the weight being in, in, in Asia and particularly with China and India. And it seems to me you have to think about how you can create institutions, not institutions that block out the U.S. because that's probably not our interest. Which and those institutions are being created, but institutions where the U.S. has a voice, but also involve these countries that are of rising power. I want to get to this gentleman right here. Um, Ali? Yes, uh, Dick Fizone. I'm a layman. So I, I <laughs> come at it that way. Uh, but uh, the good news is, at least from my standpoint, and I see a few other people with uh, either hair or the lack of hair, gray heads, uh, having lived back literally, uh, you know, for a good chunk of uh, the Cold War and into this era. Um, one observation in your comment, I think virtually everything today is an order of magnitude smaller in significance than it was when I was a kid. Uh, you know, uh, w the threat of, uh, of, uh, of uh, communism, uh, uh, fascism was ahead of me, but 
uh, that was that was a big deal. I don't think anybody argued you could get in. There were plenty of discussions about getting into World War One or, or excuse me, two. But the fact is, once it became clear to the populace we had a strategic problem, it was easy. Today, we only have, it appears, tactical problems. And I'd co contrast even domestically. Uh, the Great Recession, is, is this isn't even a bump compared to what uh, our forefathers went through the Great Recession. Uh, where does it fit? The fact is, at least my construct, if I'm uh, or, uh, even close to being right, uh, virtually all things today are about an order of magnitude smaller. I think. That, I mean, I think that's a very important and under um, that argument is made. I think far too infrequently. And it, it, you know, um, uh, one of the things that in researching this, my research, but it really struck me was Francis Fukuyama. You know, who was very, very close to Paul Wolfowitz, and in some ways, you could see is is in some ways the intellectual architect of some of the ideas that ultimately I think fueled our decision to go to war in Iraq. Um, is asked by Wolfowitz to come up with a kind of a, be one of a group of teams, kind of like it's kind of like modeled on the Eisenhower exercise, the Solarium. We get various different people to come up with different competing grand strategy notions. And, and uh, Fukuyama's main point is, this is not that big a, a deal. This is not that big a threat. Don't get caught up in thinking that these guys are like the communists and fascists. They're not. They're, they're, they're much weaker. And, uh, and, 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 and let's, uh, let's not blow it up and, and more than we, – we're really going to hurt ourselves more than they can hurt us. And the basic point that I think is underappreciated is the power of communism and fascism intellectually in the 30s, particularly in the 30s, which is when it, they're, they're most intellectually powerful, really comes from the idea that, that, that they can economically outproduce uh, capitalist democracy, which a lot of very serious intellectuals believe when, with the, that, that the capitalism is going to destroy itself in cycles of boom and bust. I mean, what's fascinating, and, and Nick knows this probably better than me, what's fascinating to me about, um, in some ways, the so way that it seems that the Soviets saw the Cold War is the irony is that we believed that we could contain the Soviet Union because ultimately it contained the seeds of its own destruction. The Soviets saw the same thing. The Soviets seemed to believe that the U.S. and Britain would eventually go to war. They said, look, what we know from our texts is that the great capitalist powers will fight imperial wars against one another. They'll blow each other up. Evidently, Stalin seems to believe one reason he wanted such a large sphere of influence in Eastern Europe was he thought there was going to be a nuclear war between America and the, and, uh, and the, and the, as the rising capitalist power and Britain as the declining capitalist power. And when the imperialists nuked each other, he wanted the Soviet Union to be, have some territory between it and the conflagration. And so... There was this idea that, and, and a lot, but a lot of very smart people believe that capitalism was inherently weak. I mean, the incredible accomplishment, I think, of America in the middle of the 20th century was to stabilize capitalism um, and, and, and show that it could be humane and stable and ultimately that we were right about its long-term future. And that's, I think, the continuing central challenge that we have, to show that capitalism can be decent and stable, um, uh, and particularly democratic capitalism. And I think... Um, uh, the, you know, jihadism has never offered the prospect of an economic model that could compete with, 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 with democratic capitalism. And I think that's been its fundamental intellectual weakness, which has not been, not been entirely well enough understood or, or kind of discussed enough. I mean, historically, Peter is, you know, of, of, of course, exactly right in that Stalin, in his famous Bolshoi theater speech, the speech that directly inspires Kennan to write the long telegram, which helps to lay out containment as official American policy. Stalin, in that speech, talks about the likelihood of you know, war between the great capitalist powers. Um, you're also right, I mean, this is sort of obvious, maybe implicit in your question, but the, you know, the worst case scenario for the Bush administration was that the Iraq war would sort of go the way it did in the early years, even though it picked up. You know, that was kind of the worst case, and we can survive that. We can get through it. We're all in this room. We're all okay. The worst case scenario during the Cold War is that you convince the Soviet Union that we're about to attack and they preemptively launch nuclear strikes and you know this lovely building on L Street isn't there. So yeah, definitely the uh, the stakes were higher. Um, we're going to have about five more minutes. So I, I, what I'd like to do is, um, uh, as is customary here, is to, to try to grab uh, as many last minute questions as we can and, and these guys will field those ones that they can or that they like. So, uh, uh, so uh, Ali, if you don't mind, uh, anyone with a final question, um, keep it to just a very short uh, question, and we'll try to do it all, all at once. The gentleman in the back there. Uh, I have one question. Uh, would the idea of Obama sending troops to Afghanistan – 
not only has something to do with a possible, like say the Iranians want to build their nuclear reactors and they announced they would. So there's a possibility that sanctions could come in Iran or the Israelis could strike Iran in terms of trying to destroy their ability to create nuclear weapons. And by putting more troops in Afghanistan, you got number one, troops on the border facing Iran. Number two, if Iran tried to do some mischief in Afghanistan to hurt U.S. troops because before 9-11, the northern the northern alliance had a natural alliance with iran they could even come in and be like what happened when the soviets were there where the, you got both the taliban and now the northern alliance trying to um destroy us pres us and nato presence in iran uh the gentleman right here uh, peggy oh, simpson i'm a freelance reporter spent most of the 1990s in eastern europe so you have China that's roaring straight ahead and people are, you know, predicting um, fear and trembling on the consequences of that. What a, what's your view if, the, uh, so if uh, Russia uh, implodes economically? Uh, right here. Um, hi, Tom Patterson, uh, CSIS. Um, and you're talking about containment and deterrence for Iran. You talked about you know comparing it to uh, Soviet containment, et cetera. Um, in the bipolar world of you know, of the Cold War, um, where like the U.S. and its allies, the countries necessary for that containment. This may be a broad generalization. Their interests aligned, whereas with Iran today, perhaps the countries that would be necessary for such a containment strategy, their interests don't necessarily align. You mentioned Russia with the U and Russia, U.S., even country like Germany, perhaps, and certainly Israel. So what does it mean, if you agree with that, that the countries that would be necessary for such a policy, their interests don't necessarily align? What does that mean for the efficacy of such, uh, such a containment strategy? Uh, this gentleman at the front here. Ed Berger, let me return to Vietnam. <clears throat> and the subject, ha my subject has to do with wrongful assumptions that we have had and perceptions over the decades, in fact, that have led to policies and actions. I'm impressed, I remain impressed with the, the movie The Fog of War and the revelations that uh, McNamara and General Giap declared to each other about what they thought the other side was doing. General Giap said he thought that we were taking the French place and all of that meant in Vietnam. And McNamara felt that the domino theory was, in fact, correct, that, uh, that uh, the dominoes were going to fall. Both declared, in fact, they were wrong. And I wonder if that's not a lesson that we should think about in, in general, about uh, <coughs> uh, things that drive our international policy. Are we done? Uh, so, so we've got uh, uh, two questions about Iran, um, which I suppose we should uh, uh, start first, maybe even three. Um, we have the question about um, whether Iran might um, – link up with the Northern Alliance and create some trouble for us in, in Afghanistan. We have uh, the question of uh, the misalignment of, of, of interests when it comes to containing Iran. And, and, and I, I think this gentleman's question can be uh, framed as a misperception by both the West and Iran on, on what the nature of the conflict is. Nick? Um. One point about the interests aligning, I think there's a, that's a very important thing that we don't think about enough, and it ties into one of the points that Peter and I have been making throughout this, and that is that the narrower you perceive America's interests are, in general, the more likely those interests are to align with others. And this works better in Afghanistan than it does in Iran, but to the extent our position is to, you know, stop there from it being a haven for nasty terrorists, that actually does align completely with uh, Russia's objectives for Afghanistan and China's objectives for Afghanistan. To the extent our goal in Afghanistan is to have a fully functioned democratic state that loves America, that doesn't really align with Russia and China. So narrow interests in general, though not necessarily the case with Israel, narrow interests tend to make it more likely that we'll have alliances. Um, to the first question about Iran and Afghanistan, I don't think. I, had, I hadn't actually ever heard that theory. I doubt that's part of the objective because you would think it might run the opposite way, which is if we really were planning for some kind of invasion of Iran, we would actually want to pull troops out of Afghanistan so they could be better prepared um, for Iran instead of sending them to Afghanistan. Though where they would have a shorter journey, it would still be there. 
involved in a different mission. So I don't think that's I, – I don't think – I don't think Obama has as many games going on as previous administrations, and I don't think even if he had this particular game going on, it would be one that would uh, make sense. I guess, um, I mean, I, I think that you could easily imagine that the Obama administration would have come in with this idea that its grand strategy in the Middle East could be uh, to, to, to change a relation with Iran in this fundamental way, just as Nixon, to go back to my Nixon analogy, changed the relationship with China, um, and just as the changed relationship with China all of a sudden gave us a lot more leverage to the Soviet Union, and Nixon hoped also a way of getting out honorably in, in Vietnam, even though it didn't work very well, that basically that a, a, bit, a chain, different relationship with Iran would really be fundamental to our ability to have an honorable withdrawal from Iraq and Afghanistan, since that in the strange thing about the Iran, about the Afghanistan and Iraq wars is that in our interest, there, as Nick's saying, there really is a lot of alignment. I mean, the, 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 the North, the, Iran helped to put Karzai into power. They were extremely <laughs> hostile to the Taliban. They were extremely hostile to Saddam. And the people that we've put in power in Iraq are mostly people who basically came of age politically in Iran, these Shia Islamist parties like, you know, Dawah and Skiri, basically parties incubated in Iran, are fair, you know, fairly sympathetic to Iran. The guy that in Iraq that we don't like the most, Maqtad al-Sadr, is also the, of the Shia leaders, the one who was, who was furthest from Iran uh, and most anti-Iranian. So you could really imagine that if you could change the relationship with Iran, um, that it could, be make, it could make those wars in Afghanistan and Iraq much easier. And in fact, our initial success in Afghanistan really did depend a lot on the support of the Iranians. Um, of course, it's easier said than done because we have some small differences with them, like the fact that they would love to have a, a much better relationship with the United States as long as they have the nuclear weapons, and we would like to have a, and, and continue to maintain relations with Hamas and Hezbollah, and we would like to have a much better relationship with them premised on the fact that they don't have nuclear weapons and cut off Hezbollah and Hamas. So it turns out to be more difficult in practice uh, than in theory. Um, uh, I guess from the point of perceptions, um, you know, I think it's 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 a it's a it's a really it's a really important point. It's a, it's a maybe it's a s simple point, but it's 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 a it's a crucial one. And I think that um, one of the things that makes me think about um, is the fact that we it was much easier for America when America was dealing with adversaries and, and allies in Europe to imagine to have a kind of rich cultural understanding of the perspe historical perspectives and cultural forces that would lead people in Germany or France or even in Russia to, to see the world that, as they did. You know, as Nick, Nick writes, you know, we had a whole group of people, we had all these immigrants who came from Europe who were so important in America's foreign policy and intellectual life during the Cold War, you know, from, from Henry Kissinger to the position of Brzezinski to Helmut Solenfeld to Madeleine Albright, wave after wave of people with a rich, deep understanding. And then, you know, incredibly influential intellectuals, Hans Morgenthau, Hannah Arendt. Um, we really don't have anywhere near anything like this vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the Islamic world, just as we did not in Vietnam. You know, and the, the irony of the best and the brightest is that these guys were also brilliant, but they knew nothing about Southeast Asia. Um, uh, and they had no ability to they, – they thought it was crazy that the Vietnamese would see us as, a, as, as, the, as the similar to the French. Of course we weren't similar to the French. We know we're not imperialists. But it was, it was a real ignorance of, of, of the way in which Vietnamese – and we saw that the Vietnamese were going to be lackeys of China, which, which a, a rich understanding of Vietnamese history would have suggested didn't make any sense. The Chinese and Vietnamese were at war three years after, we, after the Vietnam War ended. So I think – one of the cultural problems in the United States is to figure out how to bring the kind of rich, deep expertise about the, the greater Middle East that exists in the American academy and in our immigrant communities into American foreign policy making. And there are a lot of ideological and cultural barriers to that. Amongst them, the fact that a lot of the people who have that expertise have a set of views that are not particularly easily assimilable, you know, can't be that assimilated into our foreign policy discourse because, for instance, on Israel, they may be radically more, dramatically more hostile than, than any kind of, any mainstream American position is willing to adopt. But still, I think that, it, and, I, and I give the Obama administration credit for that. I think that they are, if you look about, I mean, if you look about the fact that they've brought in Vali Nasser to work with Richard Holbrook, I think they are trying to tap in to certain kind of, expertise of people who really understand these societies from the inside in the way that we really didn't have during Vietnam. And that gives me a little bit more hope about how things may play out. So we did have that during the Iraq War, but uh, with Chalabi and them, but uh, there was more of a, uh, a, a 
biased group of sorts. That's true. But I think it's precisely because, I mean, I think Chalabi and, and Kanan Maki and Fuad Ajami were able to be, and I think Fuad Ajami and Kanan Maki are smart, even honorable, you know, honorable people, but because there was no discourse with the larger Middle East Studies Associations, right, where 98% of those guys, 99% of them were dramatically against the Iraq War, but the only person who had any currency who could get a meeting with Bush people was, were, were the couple of people who spoke Arabic and were for the war that I think it gave a really distorted picture. Um, can we can we touch just briefly because the time is time is short on the issue of Russia? We were gonna uh, we we're gonna talk about that. Um, Nick, you had some thoughts about whether perhaps uh, uh, Russia uh, Russia and the, the relationship with Russia is taking perhaps a good turn that 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 for the first time in some years maybe there's some hope of of. Uh, a Russian partnership of the kind we thought we were having in the 90s. Um, the question was, you know, what about a Russian implosion? Well, so to the first part of that question, I think uh, one thing Obama has not gotten enough credit for is you haven't reset the relations with Russia, but they're going much better, and they're all sorts of – you look at – if you look at the small things, the relationship between U.S. and Russia, during the Bush years, everything went wrong. During the Obama years, it's kind of 50-50, right? So they've – they've stopped helping Iran build their nuclear plan, and they say, you know, well, we've lost the screwdrivers or whatever they're saying. But the bottom line is they're, they've stopped helping on that. You know, the START Treaty looks like it's going to move forward, and it looks like there's going to be a kind of interim agreement which allows us to keep inspectors in Russia and them to keep inspectors here until, the, until it's solved. Like on, you know, on some issues, like whether we can have an air corridor over Russia to help resupply our troops in Afghanistan, there's still, you know, all sorts of justifications why we can't have that. But things are starting to work, and I think that's because of the relationship between Obama and Medvedev, and because of the um, the change in policy on um, on missile defense. Though I was I, I recently gave a talk. It was funny. It was a conference honoring Gromyko, which is you know shows how far relationships have changed. Like next up, I'm going to be talking at a conference honoring Molotov. Um, <laughs> and I you know I spent a lot of the conference talking to a guy who I'm certain was KGB in the Russian embassy, who kept trying to convince me that actually the United States still has plans to invade, and the withdrawal of missile defense has nothing to do with that. And we've got new secret ones we're building in Poland, and we'll get them. Um, but I think inside the Kremlin, I think there has been a, a, a great softening towards towards the United States, and I think that is very useful and will be very helpful in the in the coming years. Um, how worried should we be about a Russian implosion? Less so than in the past, but the consequences, of course, are horrific. And one of the things that people don't talk about at the end of the Cold War is the um, is the lack of work that has been done in disabling the nuclear systems, putting them, you know, separating the the fuel from the missiles, and doing all the things that you can do to prevent somebody from launching. I just wrote a long story for Wired about a Soviet doomsday machine, which was a device that would have automated Soviet retaliation to an American nuclear strike. And for complicated reasons that are too long to go into, I think it actually helped make the Cold War safer, the invention of this device in the mid-1980s. But what's amazing is that they built this device at the height of the Cold War when they were most afraid of a, a Reagan preemptive strike. And it hasn't been disabled. It hasn't been taken offline. This, this system is still, is still active, this you know, device of nuclear retaliation. And there's a lot of steps that should have been taken to disable things like that that you know, to the extent we can't take them would be good, and to the extent we can take them would limit the dangers of a Russian implosion, which I don't think is likely, but which would, could be catastrophic. Peter, any final thoughts? No. Yep. Okay, well, and I want to thank everybody for coming. And first, let me say, um, buy Nick Thompson's book. It's sitting right out here. It's great. <laughs> Mine got two, actually. Oh, I, I, I did not know what I was going to say. <laughs> Peter's, you have book, to go yeah. to, you have to go to Amazon, but buy Peter's. It's wise and brave, and, uh, and his next book will be too, uh, so mm -hmm. I've heard. Peter's so, book's terrific. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Peter Beinart. Thank you, Nick Thompson. Thank you, uh, New America. All right.